So about one month from now is when that favorable seasonality might start to, to fade. Um, Hello everyone. Today, Benjamin Cowan talks about the S&P 500 outlook and predicts about the interest rates and price trends. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. Sort of the views that we've expressed on the channel for the last several months, just to sort of bring everyone up to speed in case you're new, is we were looking for this correction over here, about a five to 10% correction. And the reason for that, as we've expressed previously, was that in pre-election years, we tend to get a seasonal correction by the S&P 500 around that August, September, October timeframe, right? So this is the average of all prior pre-election years, and this is 2023. If you just look at some of the prior pre-election years, here's 2019, Here's um, 2015, here's 2011, right? There tends to be this correction around that Q3 timeframe, sometimes going into October. And really because of how far extended we were, again, looking at it compared to prior pre-election years, it sort of made, you know, made me think that it would likely, it could be up to about a 10% correction in the S&P 500. And that also, the bond market would fall during that same time, right? We should see bonds fall as higher for longer finally gets priced in, right? So if we were to overlay the 10-year yield onto this chart, the, the idea back over here was that higher for longer needed to get priced in. And when it got priced in, when you get a bear steepener, that is bearish, right? It's in the name, right? It's bearish for risk assets when you get a bear steepener. And so... That was sort of the view that it, it we're, we're likely going to enter into a time where both stocks and bonds fall. Now, after that correction finished, a few you know a few months later, it typically takes like two to three months. Sometimes it only takes like one month. We noted that we are likely going to enter into some favorable seasonality for the S and P 500 going into the end of the year especially with the bear steepener behind us, okay? So I actually was quite vocal, especially on ITC premium, that this was going to be a significant top in the 10-year yield, right? And that bonds were likely bottoming out. And so far, that seems to be the case, right? We've seen the bond market bottom out and it's up a lot. In fact, you may be surprised to know, I was actually surprised to see this, um, but if you actually go look at, at something like TLT, one of the things you'll notice is that it's up from the low. It's up about 20%, 20% move, okay? Now, compare that to the S&P 500 since October. The S&P is up 15%. Now, you might say, well, why don't you pick on something else, right, besides the S&P? The NASDAQ has had one hell of a rally. So let's go look at that. The NASDAQ since October is up about 17 to 18%. So what's fascinating to me is that while we've had an explosive rally in stocks, and we've had an explosive, or the S&P and an explosive rally in the NASDAQ, the bond market has actually outperformed those. And in the same way that we got this bear steepener that was bearish for risk assets, now the bond market going back up and treasury yields falling has been a tailwind for those same assets, okay? And so, you know, this was why, you know, back over here in Q3, I, I thought we would get a correction and then favorable seasonality going into the end of the year. Now, over the last few videos, there, there were, there were no, it wasn't just the bond market um, that sort of, you know, led me to believe that there would be some type of, of, of rally going into the end of the year. It was also because, and I, I mentioned this a few times, you know, a month or so ago, Yellen issued shorter duration than the market was expecting. I think that had a, a, a big contribution because it was really on around that time where yields started to collapse. And then the other thing was 
the market, I, I think, was finally starting to sniff out a, a Fed pause. The S&P has, has sort of seen this rally and sort of, sort of leads to the next question of, well, you know, when would it end, right? First of all, guys, there can be pullbacks at any time. I mean, this is, we're now in what? This is our seventh green week in a row. So, I mean, I don't really know how often that happens, but I imagine it's not very frequently, especially of this magnitude. When you think about where the S&P was in October, it's now about 15% in in, le in about a month and a half, which is not, you know, that's not that common of, of a thing to witness, like a 15% move. I mean, annual returns for the S&P over the course of an entire year do not tend to be, you know, m much more than 12% averaged out. And we've just got a 15% move in a month and a half, okay? And one of the reasons why I think we've seen this is again because it's sort of the, the trifecta right yellen issuing shorter duration the the bond market really bottoming out which could be tied to the first thing i said favorable seasonality and also the market interpreting the fed um, as having paused interest rates and, and reaching the terminal rate and oftentimes once the terminal rate is reached there will be a sizable rally in the s p and oftentimes i think the sort of the impulsive rally after a pause uh, can be about 20, 25%. And, and so far, the market's up about 15%. Now, I don't know if it's going to go all the way up 20, 25%, but it's possible, right? It's possible if you just look at prior averages. But averages are made up of, of you know, rallies that are, are above that level and below that level. And most rallies don't end up just being what the average of all prior rallies are, right? So we do need to consider that. In terms of seasonality, you know, you can really see that there does tend to be continued seasonality, favorable seasonality going into the next couple of weeks. Um, I mean, it certainly doesn't mean that it has to play out like that, but there's definitely a chance that it that it does. If you were to look at election years, there can be some unfavorable seasonality starting about mid-January. Okay, so... And it's interesting because you can really see that averaging out all prior election years, the S&P is, is kind of flat for the first half of, of election years. Now, one of the reasons for that is it's not because every election year is bad. I mean, if you look at 2016, um, we did get an initial sell-off, but then it, it rallied on up. Um, if you look at, at 2012, it, it really wasn't that bad. Um, and so, and you can see that these yearly returns for the S&P back in 2012 and 2016, I mean, they were only about 11, you know, 10%, maybe a little bit more. We just saw a 15% rally in the S&P in a month and a half. In terms of seasonality, there is still favorable seasonality until about mid-January, right? So about one month from now is when that favorable seasonality might start to, to fade. Um, but I mean, in, until then, as long as there's not, you know, some type of major negative catalyst or anything like that, um, you know, the S&P, I mean, of course, it, it can have pullbacks along the way. But one of the things to remember is that when the long end of the yield curve falls, especially as quickly as it is, right, when the long end falls, so looking at, at the 10-year yield, when it falls this quickly, it tends to be stimulative for risk assets, right? And, and, you know, this time has not been different, right? It, it has been very stimulative for risk assets. And as it continues to drop, it could continue that, that sort of, it could continue to have that same effect. Where it could become an issue, and there's no guarantees, right? Where it could become an issue is if it just continues to fall and fall and fall. Because there, there's a lot of discussions, right, as to whether the Fed, again, is making a mistake by cutting at the you know by cutting maybe in early 2024 because it could lead to another wave of inflation and i think a lot of people are rightfully worried about that i mean i, I think it makes sense to be worried about that um, before i go show you some of those charts again i, I just want to remind you um or, or take a, another look at at just say apple because apple is actually really following its prior pre-election years quite closely and you can kind of see you know, where it is today compared to all prior pre-election years going back to the 1980s. And, you know, normally it, it gets one little last pop up into the end of the year. So we'll see if that it will see if that pans out. And then you look at election years and you can see that 
what happens is after about halfway through January, there tends to be some weakness, right? So, which is still about a month away, right? It's still about a month away. Um, but it, it's just, I mean, it, it, to me, it's interesting to look at because, I mean, seasonality does not always play out, right? But it did play out in terms of the Q3 correction. It has played out in terms of sort of the risk rally um, that we've seen over the last few weeks. But we'll have to keep an eye on, on what the longer the yield curve continues to do. And, you know, I, I think, again, I, I think people are rightfully concerned about inflation reaccelerating, right? It's not necessarily my base case at the moment, but I mean, it, it could turn into my base case depending on, on how the data comes in. I think, I think my base case right now is that there is still a lot of lag effects that we need to feel from all the rate hikes that have already come through. And, you know, there's, there's a chance that, that we just haven't, felt all of that yet. One way to potentially interpret this is that the market isn't as fearful of inflation um, at the moment, because if it were, you would expect the long yield curve to go up. A counterpoint to that, though, is that in the short term, markets can often behave irrationally. And even if there is a second wave of inflation, it doesn't mean that the 10-year yield has to immediately go up, right? It could be that, you know, people are, are, are not really sure if the Fed's cutting because they see something bad coming. Um, or if they're just cutting because there's political pressure to do so, right? There's just no way to know. Um, and it's also just about, you know, supply and demand as well in the short term. So it's hard to say exactly. I mean, you can always come up with a narrative for everything. So it's easy to assign a narrative, especially in hindsight. But I, I do think it's, it, you know, it, it's relevant to sort of think that just about a, a month and a half ago, the 10-year yield was at 5%. And now it just broke below 4%, which is a really substantial move to the downside in a very short period of time. And so, you know, I, we'll have to see if that trend continues or not. Because if it does, then we could reach an inflection point where lower yields is no longer stimulative for risk assets. And they start to worry about, like, why are yields falling? But again, there's no guarantee. I mean, we'll have to, we'll have to see where the 10-year yield settles out. And if it can, if it can find support in any of these other prior areas, or if it just continues to collapse, uh, which would theoretically happen if if their Fed has gone too far, and and pushed us into a recession. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Benjamin Cowan. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.